Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, seekers, tweakers, and headline leakers, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel, where we discuss books and little else. And welcome back to Random Reviews, folks, where we take a work of canonical repute, uh, befriend it, approach it, get it round the campfire, and then um, um, follow through and slit its throat, and um, lay it out upon the table, upon the surgeon's table, and see what's going on um, under, underneath the cover, indeed. Uh, so this is uh, George Eliot's Silas Marlowe that we're going through today, a rather small work, uh, something, again, which I've uh, picked out many, many uh, key points from, and I'm going to share with you a few administrative points just before we get going, before we, uh, before we pick up the pace. Um, uh, there is a simmering uh, possibility of a delivery driver coming in and rudely interrupting us, um, which of course will then result in my recording of the consumption of his own gonads. Unfortunately, if he does indeed interrupt us here, then um, I shall have to deprive a, a very fine family of a very fine father, I'm sure. But unfortunately, I've presumed that the delivery driver is going to be a man, haven't I? That, that's, um, that shows you an awful lot. Um, and also, indeed, by the time that you are watching this, it will be, of course, Good Friday in, in Britain. And um, though I do not come from a religious family, though I do not believe that Jesus Christ is risen or whatever, um, that is usually the day uh, on which um, the adversarial uh, rugby teams of Hull FC and Hull KR play out. Um, I am indeed on the red side of the city, on the east side of the city, um, and as most um, sort of adversaries deem one another, um, Hull FC in the black and whites are, of course, um, knuckle-dragging, gutter-dwelling, complete and utter execrable inferiors who do not have one single uh, uh, human character, you know, meritable and um, admirable human characteristic to list. They are awful in every sense of the word. They smell, they putrefy, they poison everywhere they enter. They live all live in caravans. None of them have got anything uh, like mortgages. They are all awful individuals. And therefore, we are likely to beat them by 40 and 50 points because we are much better than them at the sport. Um, and so, yes, that's a long way of saying... If you are interested by this, if you've been interested by this um, and you want to discuss it, I won't be able to discuss it on Friday the 29th or whatever, because indeed um, I shall be uh, uh, sort of standing on a table hurling all sorts of invectives at the officials and indeed at the television. So, um, yeah, it's a long way of saying leave your emails and replies until Saturday, folks, if that's OK with you. But anyway, that was a long introduction, was it not? And um, let us get on with this review. So this is, yeah, George Eliot's Silas Marner from, I think, 18, yeah, 1860. And this, for Eliot's scholars and admirers and literary followers, is a very interesting little pamphlet, frankly. A very, very, very interesting little, um, it's almost a novella, I think. I think it's just, just long enough to be called a novel, but um, it's um, the work that cut across her writing of Romola. Um, I've reviewed that already for Victober, about five or six months ago now. And, um, yeah, it's something that, that when she was writing to her publisher, sort of, I am writing a story which came across my other plans by a sudden inspiration. So it was, you know, she was writing, a, she was with George Henry Lewis in um, in Europe and, and, and together they, they came to the conclusion that she ought to write a book about, I think, 13th century Florence, I think it was, with the death, the death of Lorenzo de' Medici and the city's search for a new leader and um, Savonarola or Savonarolo, the... Um, uh, uh, Catholic uh, priest, I think, that sort of had a, a, a kind of mythical and um, uh, a supernatural hold over many of the, the visitors. A big sprawling thing that, that, that needed much research and much precision and much um, much hubris, actually, quite a lot of confidence to, to, to compose. And, and yet this small uh, sort of uh, proto-Victorian uh, myth-making uh, um, tale cut across that. Um, a small thing that that, that is... Sort of, it doesn't really regard itself as, as particularly very clever. It's a little bit self-deprecating within in, in and of itself on its own terms. Um, and yet she, she, she uh, viewed this uh, as a level of particular importance so as to stop work on Romola and essentially just smash this out in presumably a couple of months, I would imagine. Um, so yes, it's a story of a, a meek, fragile, uh, 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 but I'm going to use the adjective bent, by which I mean um, stooping, stooped, shall we say, rather than homosexual. Um, and yeah, it's just a sort of sort of little, uh, small, fragile man um, whose bones you could imagine creaking. Um, but we, we, it's a bit of a misleading cover because we, we start off with him at the age of about 20 or 25 in, what's the phrase, Lantern Yard, I believe it is. He's a, he's a God-fearing man, as, as good a God-fearing Christian as any. And um, yeah, he's convicted or, or um, is excommunicated because 
he's um, uh, uh, deemed to have, have committed a robbery, or at least you know the rector's money or the, the money in the rectory goes goes missing, and he's the guy on char in charge on duty, and, and uh, nobody believes him. Uh, nobody believes his story, but he's um, he's. Uh, uh, cataleptic, I think he's got. He suffers from catalepsy, and um, so that means that he can just essentially suspend the world for fifteen and twenty minutes and um, not know of what happened during that period. And then that's a really, really crucial point because that's a. I think it's a little bit of a lazy Deus Ex Machina from George Eliot. The fact that she can just for the two crucial plot points in here, she can just click her fingers and have Silas Marner um, freeze in real time and have things happen whilst he is, um, inactive. So, yeah, I, I wasn't too sure about that, but, but, um, you can see how the, 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 um, the, the concept came to her. But yes, many, many things to point out. Um, so as soon as he goes to Ravello, where, where, where the majority of this novel takes place, and, um, bred by superstition, um, they are really rather, uh, uh suspicious of, um, Mr. Mana in the village. They, they, don't think that he is, they, they, they think that he's somebody they need to keep on their radar. He's um, uh, quite sort of self-effacing, as I say, he's certainly not brash or confident. He's certainly not a community man, keeps himself very much to himself. And yeah, he's it's, it's just a, uh, he, 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 he breeds suspicion because he is, he isn't communal. And of course you have the busybodies who, you know, which is the flotsam and jetsam of village life, where people create rumours and invent rumours and stir the pot. Um, but yeah, he, 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 the introduction tackles this a little bit. He, he, um, renounces his faith essentially and, and becomes, um, a little bit of an, an avaricious git. He, he, he's not interested in the commercial aspects of his weaving, which is obviously a, a much in demand profession. And, uh, yeah, so, so he earns an awful lot of money on that, but he doesn't use the money to any, uh, personal avail or to any, to self aggrandize or anything. He just keeps it in a fine gold pot and, um, you know, engages in sort of nocturnal revelry when his day's work, his 16 hour work day is done. Um, he's able to, to sort of go underneath the floorboards and, and look at his, look at the miser's hoard or the miser's stash. Um, and then he has that stolen by, um, the brother of Godfrey, whose name I'm going to forget, Dunstan, um, who we introduced, we were introduced to a second, uh, uh, plot tendril. We have Godfrey, who is the son of the, the local squire, who is, who is, um, was manipulated into a, uh, a, a rather ungainly and, um, scurrilous marriage, uh, a sort of a, a lord nomadic as a wife. And um, yeah, he needs to earn back money so that Dunstan then doesn't reveal to the entire village that he's been uh, subject to an inauspicious marriage. Dunstan goes and sells his horse, kills the horse, and then blows all of the money and um, steals Silas's guineas when, when the door is open whilst he is uh, suffering from a cataleptic episode. Um, and so he has his money stolen. That then means that his... Um, so the financial capital is uh, non-existent, but his social capital is um, is sort of reimbursed, as it were, because he uh, becomes a, a little bit of a pillar of the community. He at least inspires a little bit more sympathy within his fellow villagers, and um, yeah, becomes a little bit of a nicer individual. And um, yeah, people people uh, give him a bit of the time of day, um, and that's that's essentially all I want to give you for now. Um, there is the uh, advent, or at least the the entrance of a of a small little toddler um, whose bungling uh, cuteness George Eliot uh, encapsulates gorgeously as per usual. Um, but yeah, just a few sections that I want to read out, and then we can explore them in a little bit more detail. Uh, uh, I, I, I might as well make it known first of all that George Eliot is is. Um, she comprises uh, one of the, my two twin Victorian peaks. Her and Anthony Trollope are um, my, my two brightest lights from that period. I've got a bit of time for Dickens. Of course, I've got time for the Brontes. Um, who else? I've got time for Wilkie Collins. I've got time for the poets Ty Tennyson and Co. But these two, Mr. Elliot, uh, Mr. Elliot, Miss Elliot and uh, uh, Mr. Trollope are the ones that do it for me, do the most for me. Um, so this is a, a section... Um, where Elliot talks about uh, Mr. Marner's displacement when he moves from Lantern Yard to Ravelo and all of the, the sort of the geographical upset that is so common. You will forgive me looking over my uh, phone rather a lot because indeed um, there are, uh, as I say, the, the, the delivery man's imminent and I really don't want him to interrupt. Um, so yes, this is this is Marner moving to Ravelo. Um, we know it was believed that each territory was inhabited and ruled by its own divinities so that a man could cross the bordering heights and be out of reach of his native gods whose presence was confined to the streams and the groves and the hills among which he had lived from his birth. And poor Silas was vaguely conscious of something not unlike the feeling of primitive men, when they fled thus, in fear or in sullenness, from the face of an unpropitious deity. 
It seemed to him that the power he had vainly trusted in among the streets and at the prayer meetings was very far away from this land which he had taken refuge, where men lived in careless abundance, knowing and needing nothing of that trust which for him had been turned to bitterness. There you are, you see his isolation, his, uh, 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 the, the, these foreign surroundings, and you see how much um, sort of the personal meaning and grounding we take in our familiar surroundings when somebody is completely displaced from that. It's really rather interesting. And you'll notice there, Miss Elliot did it sort of really, really whimsically, um, really effectively, um, without being, she can go on, she can be circumlocutious, she can be a little bit pointed, and she can be a little bit gnomic, um, but that, that didn't populate this book uh, too much, but we can forgive her of that when um, some of the passages are just so apt, so refulgent, as I used in my last video, and I will so again. Um, so yeah, next up we have, um, this is where we're talking about Nancy Lameter, who is Godfrey's promised girl. He's, he very much wants to manage, marry her deep down within, but then of course if ever he does propose, um, the, 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 the legalities of a second marriage of course uh, will, will, will come into the matter and um, yeah, the people will know about his, his terrible secret. Um, but this is, yeah, talking about uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Nancy Lameter and that his um, sort of his uh, uh, romantic enthrallment, his appreciation of her is perhaps alluded to as, as maybe a little bit of a, um, of a distraction. So we have, for four years he had thought of Nancy Lameter and wooed her with tacit patient worship as the woman who made him think of the future with joy. She would be his wife and would make home lovely to him as his father's home had never been. And it would be easy, when she was always near, to shake off those foolish habits that were no pleasures, but only a feverish way of annulling vacancy. There we are, a feverish way of annulling vacancy. That's an excellent way of um, uh, 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 characterising, you know, just sort of hedonistic pleasure and, and, and short-term self-gratification, which he goes through. He's not, he's not too much of a... Uh, a hedonist, but he, but he, you know, he likes the occasional drink, and Miss Elliot likes to point that out. Um, next up, we have um, Mrs. Winthrop, who, when, when, essentially, uh, Marla is is um, visited by a small toddler, and um, yeah, Mrs. Uh, Dolly Winthrop is is uh, the new character of of, of um, the novel, and a, a sort of small one. One of the things that is has been remarked on by scholars about Silas Marner is the um, very mature and very considerate treatment of the working classes, of the proles, of the hoi polloi. And um, yes, so we have uh, an excellent description here of Mrs. Winthrop. For all you prospective authors, and you're, you, um, you, you budding writers, take heed now, because this is, um, this is how it should be done. Uh, Mrs. Winthrop was one of these. She was in all respects a woman of scrupulous conscience, so eager for duties that life seemed to offer them too scantily, unless she rose at half past four, through this, through, uh, th though this through a scarcity of work over the more advanced hours of the morning, which it was a constant problem with her to remove. Yet she had not the vixenish temper, which is sometimes supposed to be a necessary condition of such, ha such habits. She was a very mild, patient woman, whose nature it was to seek out all the sadder and more serious elements of life and pasture her mind upon them. She was the person always first thought of in Ravelo when there was illness or death in a family, when leeches were to be applied or there was a sudden disappointment in a monthly nurse. She was a comfortable woman, good-looking, fresh-complexioned, having her lips always slightly screwed, as if she felt herself in a sick room with the doctor or the clergyman present. But she was never whimpering, no one had seen her shed tears, she was simply grave and inclined to shake her head and sigh, almost imperceptibly, like a funereal mourner who is not a relation. That's stylistically gorgeous, it's got all the information in there, it's just, it's, again, you have this image of, of Elliot as a sort of uh, an omniscient deity that's just sort of looking over this, this landscape and is, is picking out seven and eight gorgeous characteristics or mentionable and, and relevant characteristics of a human being and just blending them perfectly together. Um, and that's what a writer does. You're entering their considerations and their, their consciousnesses. Um, but then we've just got the, the two final sections. Um, there is a, a, um, a what uh, poets would call a volta in the, the narrative or a, what we might call a watershed moment or at least just a, um, a bridge, a 16 year shift um, from Epi, who is the toddler that walks in on Silas Marna. Um, she is now a, what, presumably an 18 year old who is, is ready to be married. Um, but Godfrey, his marriage to, uh, he inevitably gets married to Nancy Lameter, but they are, they can't have children. They have, um, she has suffered a miscarriage, I think about four or five years after, before this takes place and comes to, and Godfrey, 
ripped with grief. Uh, Dunstan, his brother who stole Silas's money, hasn't been heard of for 16 years, and um, yeah, he he's, goes through many cogitations and decides that it behoves him to pop down to Epi and tell her that she is his daughter, and though Silas has brought her up, um, unbeknownst to both of them, that is not his proper child. Oh no, in fact, of course, Silas does know that he's not his child, but but unbeknownst to Epi, that is not his real, uh, that's not her real father, and um, Godfrey is the real one and has come to take ownership, really, rightful ownership. So, yeah, but but when, uh, again, Silas Marner, ever, ever the sort of considerate um, folk, uh, says, I won't hinder anything. If you want to go with him, Epi, that's that's fine. You know, toddle off now if you like, dear. Um, but then, but she denies it, and uh, this is a section on Godfrey's considerations. Godfrey, unqualified by experience to discern the pregnancy of Mana's simple words, felt ang felt rather angry again. It seemed to him that the weaver was very selfish, a judgment readily passed by those who have never tested their own power of sacrifice to oppose what was undoubtedly for Epi's welfare, and he felt himself called upon for her sake to assert his authority. Then we have later on with, uh, yeah, again, this is this is still part of the same scene. Um, and then this is when uh, uh, Godfrey goes back with Nancy after they've been denied ownership of Ep Epi. Um, Godfrey looks up at Nancy with a flushed face and smarting, dilated eyes. This frustration of a purpose towards which he had set out under the exalted consciousness that he was about to compensate in some degree for the greatest demerit of his life made him feel the air of the room stifling. So he's about to compensate in some degree for the greatest demerit of his life. In essence, he hasn't been able to perform the duty that he felt was ne was, was was necessary on him, and um, now he's a little bit irked, but he but he, he gets past it, don't worry, folks. Yes, so, um, again, just some comments on, on Elliot's brilliance. I, I don't need to wax lyrical uh, to a, a sickening extent as I have done in the past, but, but it's something that I haven't really found in anybody else apart from Trollope, really. I haven't found, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a kind of granular, surgical, uh, dissection of um, the, 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 the communicative minutiae of a scene. It's not, I mean, Tolstoy is really rather nebulous and sort of sweeping and talks about the heart and the soul and gravity and earth and providence, whereas Miss Elliot just tends to talk about, okay, why, it, why is it that he was nervous then? And then five seconds later, he moved over to the window and then five seconds after that, he came across to the table and furrowed his brow and his eye flitted across three people and why was it that his desires are being um, um, shuffled or, or why is it that the, the old man in the corner is rather meek? Why is it that Epi is um, between a rock and a hard place? What's going on? Everything is explained in the finest, most minute detail, second by second almost, in exhaustive shira esque um, 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 detail that you don't even need to you don't even need to bother with it you 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 have everything explained there is no question and it's all gorgeous um, and that is indeed how you um, you you report a scene in a controlled manner um, so yeah I, I absolutely love this again it's a small thing it would be a great introduction to Elliot if you've never read anything before and you don't want to to tackle the um, the flagrant beast that is Middlemarch I would highly recommend Silas Marner to you. Um, and yeah, I, I've read quite a lot of Elliot now. I've, I've, I've got some of her, there's a big white van, which is probably the delivery driver. So I might have to end this rather, uh, uh, I might have to cut this short, but yes, really, really enjoyable. And um, I am indeed starting uh, Wolf Hall in the next few uh, uh, moments, folks. Potentially, I'm probably gonna end this recording and, and start right ahead because um, a few of you guys have been um, tugging on father's coattails and um, you know, tugging on his, 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 his dressing gown tie, that is not a euphemism, uh, for me to read Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. Um, I read an article uh, by her, obviously she's long, she's, she, she died a few years ago, but I read a Guardian article the other week and really, really enjoyed it. I think she's going to be an idiosyncratic writer that's going to be excellent company, so I'm looking forward to that too. But yes, um, don't email me on Friday, folks, because I'm recording this on Thursday, but on uh, in 24 hours' time I will be, as I say, stood on a tabletop, uh, 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 cross-eyed with uh, inebriation and uh, engaging in, in the foulest oaths possible. So yes, um, I'm going to cut this video short of 20 minutes and thank you ever so much for watching BookTube and say goodbye.